good morning, everyone. Welcome. It is nine o'clock on the dot. So thank you all so much for being here, especially, um, you know, in the middle of your summer. We're going to give it just a couple minutes for any um, last minute people to join us, and then we will get started uh, diving in with the scientific and engineering practices. All right, so uh, again, welcome and thank you so much for being here today. My name is Leah Pinto. I'm the Director of Professional Development for EduSmart. Um, and we really do appreciate you giving up your time. I hope you will get a lot out of this. Um, I want to start off by saying that uh, if you've been with us for the other parts of the series today, uh, I'm in a different location. I, I'm in East Texas. So I don't know if any of y'all here are from East Texas, but you know it's been a huge mess around here ever since last Thursday. We had a massive storm come through. People have been out of power. There's still like 50,000 people who haven't had power since last Thursday. We're really lucky because we got it back a couple days ago, but internet has been a little bit um, iffy. So if something happens and uh, and my internet drops out, I will rejoin you momentarily. The meeting will not end. We have a co-host, it'll be fine, but um, just please be patient if there's any technology issues. Um, and also to say I am working from home today and I have um, dogs and chickens and cats and children. So anything could happen. Um, so please be patient with that as well. Um, I'm sure y'all understand how that goes. So, um, Today, we're going to be talking about the science and engineering practices. I, uh, as I was preparing for this uh, workshop and doing my research on it, I kept like ending up going down these rabbit holes. Um, there's a lot to unpack today. It is, there's just like so much built into these new scientific and engineering practices. So we're going to be spending a lot of time really just talking today. We'll take um, multiple short breaks as opposed to the last couple formats where we like did all the direct teach portion and then we did breakout rooms. We will still have a breakout room time so that you can you know, start to work on practical application. And that's really gonna be our focus today is talking about practical application of these SCPs. We're gonna look at them in detail and a lot of vertical alignment as well, because we, uh, it's it's very helpful to see how the students are expected to progress from kindergarten all the way up through high school to really understand the intent of the science and engineering practices. Um, so we'll spend a lot of time talking about that and how we build the kids up to this. Now, obviously, the first couple of years are going to be really tough because this is new skills for every grade level. That's why it's great that we're looking at this now and seeing what we can start to implement this next year so that in 2024, when the actual standards change, we can really be ready for that and our kids will be maybe a little more prepared and they'll have some tools already in their tool belt. So um, let me make sure I am sharing my sound and let's dive into the science and engineering practices. So I'm gonna start us off with a TED talk today. Um, this is, we're not going to watch the whole thing. I highly encourage you to go and, um, and watch the rest of this. This, these kids are really amazing. I'm going to start us in about exact same ways of being unique children because they're experts in play. We're talking about, um, how students can do science and what level we can expect them to do science. So if you add rules to play, you have a game. That's actually what an experiment is. So armed with these two ideas, that science is a way of being and experiments are play, we asked, can anyone become a scientist? And who better to ask than 25, eight to 10 year old children because they're experts in play. So I took my B arena down to a small school in Devon. And the aim of this was to not just get the kids to see science differently, but through the process of science to see themselves differently, right? The first step was to ask a question. Now, I should say that we didn't get funding for this study because the scientists said small children could make a useful contribution to science and the teacher said kids couldn't do it. So we did it anyway, right? Of course. So 
here are some of the questions. I put them in small print so you wouldn't bother reading it. The point is that five of the questions that the kids came up with were actually the basis of science publication in the last five to 15 years, right? So they were asking questions that were significant to expert scientists. Now here, I want to share the stage with someone quite special, right? She was one of the young people who was involved in this study, and she's now one of the youngest published scientists in the world. Right? She will now, once she comes onto stage, will be the youngest person to ever speak at TED. Right? Now science and asking questions about courage. Now she is the personification of courage because she's going to stand up here and talk to you all. So Amy, would you please come up? So Amy's going to help me tell the story of what we call the Black Oaten Bees Project. And first she's going to tell you the question that they came up with. So go ahead, Amy. Thank you, Bo. We thought that it was easy to see the link between humans and apes in the way that we think, because we look alike. But we wondered if there's a possible link with other animals. It'd be amazing if humans and bees thought similar, since they seem so different from us. So we asked if humans and bees might solve complex problems in the same way. Really, we want to know if bees can also adapt themselves to new situations using previously learned rules and conditions. So what if bees can think like us? Well, it'd be amazing since we're talking about an insect with only one million brain cells, but actually it makes a lot of sense they should, because bees, like us, can recognize a good flower regardless of the time of day, the light, the weather, or from any angle it approached it from. So the next step was to design an experiment, which is a game. So the kids went off and they designed this experiment, and so, the, well, game. And so, Amy, can you tell us what the game was and the puzzle that you set the bees? The puzzle we came up with was an if-then rule. We asked the bees to learn not just to go to a certain colour, but to a certain coloured flower only when it's in a certain pattern. They were only rewarded if they went to the yellow flowers, if the yellow flowers were surrounded by the blue, or if the blue flowers were surrounded by the yellow. Now, there's a number of different rules the bees can learn to solve this puzzle. The interesting question is, which? What was really exciting about this project was we, and Bo, had no idea whether it was work. It was completely new and no one had done it before, including adults. <laughs> including the teachers. Oops. And that was really hard for the teachers. It's easy for a scientist to go in and not have a clue what he's doing, because that's what we do in the lab. But for a teacher not to know what's going to happen at the end of the day. So much of the credit goes to Dave Strudwick, who is the collaborator on this project. Okay? So I'm not going to go through the whole details of the study, his observation. So here are some of the students doing the observations. They're recording the data of where the bees fly. So what we're going to do is, is she still coming up here? Yeah. So you keep, keep track, please. Wait, can you help me? Can you help me, Henry? What good scientist says that? Right? Two, not there. Two. Mm -hmm. Right, so we've got our observations, we've got our data. They do the simple uh, mathematics, averaging, etc., etc. And now we want to share. That's the next step. So we're going to write this up and try to submit this for publication. Right? So we have to write it up. So we go, of course, to the pub. All right? <laughs> the one on the left is mine. Okay? Now I tell them a paper has four different sections an introduction, a methods, a results, a discussion. The introduction says, what's the question and why? Methods, what did you do? Results, what was the observation? And the discussion is, who cares? Right? That's a science paper, basically. So the kids give me the words, right? I put it into a narrative, which means that this paper is written in kids speak. It's not written by me, it's written by Amy and the other students in the class. As a consequence, this science paper begins once upon a time. <laughs> the results section, it says training phase, the puzzle, dun dun dun, right? And the methods, it says, then we put the bees into the fridge and made bee pie, smiley face, right? This is a science paper. We're going to try to get it published. So here's the title page. We have a number of authors there. All the ones in bold are eight to 10 years old. 
The first author is Black Holton Primary School because if it were ever referenced, it would be Black Holton et al and not one individual. So we submit it to a public access journal, and it says this. It said many things, but it said this. I'm afraid the paper fails our initial quality control checks in several different ways. In other words, it starts off once upon a time, the figures in crayon, etc. So we decide, we'll get it reviewed. So I send it to Dale Purvis, who is the National Academy of Science, one of the leading neuroscientists in the world, and he says, this is the most original scientific paper I've ever read, and it certainly deserves wide exposure. Larry Maloney, expert in vision, says, the paper is magnificent. The mm. Okay. <clears throat> Work would be publishable if done by adults. So what do we do? We send it back to the editor, they say no. So we asked Larry and Natalie DeHempel to write a commentary situating the findings for scientists, right? Putting in the references. And we submit it to Biology Letters. And there it was reviewed by five independent referees and it was published. Okay? All right. So we're going to stop there. Again, I highly encourage you to watch the entire um, talk. It's about 15 minutes long total. But what I hope that we can get out of this <clears throat> is that kids, these were eight to 10 year old kids, can do science, real science, not cookie cutter labs, not um, us as teachers giving them the content and the topics, but they can dig in and do real science. But it's going to take a huge shift in the way that we as teachers are presenting our content to them. Um, the point of the, of the new science standards, which are really based off of the um, next generation science standards, the scientific and engineering practices, is really to get the kids doing science. And in the past, uh, especially the, I don't know, the last set of standards that we use, it's been so content driven that we're, we've, as, as I was always, I taught seventh grade, I would always feel like, you know, I'm gonna go, okay, we're gonna learn this, and then we're gonna learn this, and then we're gonna learn this, and then we're gonna learn. And we just kept learning topics. And we never got deep into a lot of the topics because we had so much to cover. And so um, how do you make the change from content driven to process driven science? And one of the ways that we need to do this is by ditching the scientific method. So I had this poster hanging in my classroom because I love memes. I used all kinds of pictures like this, crazy stuff. Um, but this was my favorite uh, representation of the scientific method. The problem is the scientific method isn't how you do science, right? Um, we, we're teaching them a, a linear process and that's not necessarily real world. The new science standards are shifting to the, the kids being able to do real world science. And this is a huge leap for most teachers. So we want to replace the scientific method with the scientific and engineering process skills because science isn't always step by step. So by teaching them this linear progression from asking a question and doing an experiment and getting an answer, not only are we discounting the whole process of that, that really goes into learning the how to do science and what we answer, we're also making it very explanation driven. Like our, our point of doing science is to get to the end and make an explanation, which isn't always the case, right? We don't necessarily want that fact at the end of a, an experiment because those facts change. And so just because it's a fact today doesn't mean it's going to be a fact tomorrow. Maybe we're going to get new data. Maybe something else is going to happen. There's going to be changes. So we need to build in that capacity for change within the student's thinking. And the scientific method doesn't uh, represent that very well. The other problem is it's left out some really important things. There's no modeling. In, and that's spelled wrong, I realize now. Anyways, there's no modeling in the scientific method. Never does it say create a model. There's no argumentation, there's no collaboration. Like all of those are really, really important steps. Um, and we need to, to build those into our students. I think if the last couple of years have shown us anything is that we need adults 
who can discuss and shift through all the, the science that's coming out, all the information that's being thrown at them and understand what is really happening, being able to use their own critical thinking skills and their own discussion skills and argumentation skills to be able to really understand the process of science and what is going on and how it's going to constantly change. So we're replacing the scientific method with our science, scientific and engineering practices. Um, these standards seek to not only use science to describe the world and answer questions about it, but then we are also going to, how do we solve the problems that we discover? That's that engineering component. So these two are going to work together to find, understand the world and work towards solving the problems that we find in it. There is a lot of common ground between science and engineering. Every, you know, both practices are going to study the world around them. Engineers look at what they see and ask the question of how can I make it better? Or what does it need? Or how can I fix this? Or how can I um, design a process that's going to make it easier? Science looks at the world and says, how do I understand this? How do I make it fit? How do I protect it? How do I conserve it? Um, and so those practices of studying the world are the same. How do they do that? Um, and those are the scientific and engineering practices we're going to look at. And they are both very social and very collaborative undertakings, meaning kids have to talk about it. They have to be able to talk about it. And it's going to take some scaffolding and some training to get them talking in a productive way. I think for the last many years, we've kind of been working towards that with really collaborative practices for our students. But this is going to take it to a whole nother level. Um, when we start adding in that productive argumentation and productive struggle and um, we're asking our kids to argue <laughs> and that's that's uh, we have to teach them how to do that productively um, and so we're really looking at that those these practices in depth and in detail so i meant to mention uh please feel free to ask any questions that you can we're obviously a pretty small group today if you have questions raise your hand or just place them in the chat and i'll be happy to address them as we go we want to make this as specific for you and your practice in your teaching as possible so um any questions you have can help that happen so um, what are the scientific and engineering practices and how are they used? They are replacing our current science process skills in 2024. And what they are is your toolkit. They're a toolkit for doing science, not just, I don't know, and, and maybe this is more a reflection on me, but we kind of just did a nod and a pass towards this, this practice skills, um, the process skills that, that led us to our content. Um, the science and engineering practices really have to be interwoven with every single piece of content that you teach. And they are great tools to use, but if I'm a plumber, I don't just use one tool, right? If I'm an, a, an electrician and I come in, I'm going to use multiple tools and I may use three or four tools at once to solve a problem. And so we don't want to while we'll be looking at them in isolation, we don't want to think of them as I'm going to teach this skill and then this skill and then this skill. They really have to be collaborative. Like you need to have an overall understanding of them and be able to use them with everything that the students are doing. And when you start really understanding the skills, there's a lot to be able to uh, weave in with all of your practices. It just takes a little, it's going to take a little getting used to for sure. So according to NGSS, the scientific and engineering practices are a set of skills and processes that scientists and engineers use to investigate the natural world and design solutions to real world problems. They emphasize the importance of hands-on inquiry, critical thinking, and collaboration. So underlying everything we do with these new science and engineering practices are those three key components hands-on inquiry, the students actually doing the work, that critical thinking skills, evaluating it and critiquing it throughout, and collaborating and working together to build and construct explanations or solve problems. Um, so those are really key 
aspects of the science and engineering practices that are built in throughout the process. What we're going to do is um, take a look at each of the individual categories and the standards as they build from kindergarten up through biology. Um, but overall, they're kind of broken down into four very broad categories. And there is a lot of overlap between these. But if you think of them in these categories, it helps to be able to figure out what practice do I want to use at what part of my lesson. So if I'm at the introductory part of a lesson, I'm in the explain or the explore or the engage part of a 5e lesson cycle, I really want to be using the, the type of skills that are going to help the students to do that. If I'm, I'm in the explain portion, they're gonna be more in that data analysis and communicating portion. If we're in the extend and we wanna communicate our results, then you're, you know, at the end, you're going to be more into those um, critique, explain, develop explanations, um, and really extend their learning. And then the fourth category, which is unique to Texas, this isn't really uh, specific in the NGSS science and engineering skills, is basically that science and research. And this is um, applying the history of science to what is going on now. So we're recognizing some specific scientists in the early grade levels. And then in the later grade levels, it's kind of a more broad, just recognize the contribution of scientists and how they are impacting society today. So it's really um, using the history of science to know what is going on now and critically evaluate what the impact of science and research and engineering is on society. And those are explicit skills that are built into these the Texas SAPs. So um, it's important to, while some of these skills, you wanna make sure you're learning in context, some of these skills will have to be done separately, like with a research project or something along those lines. We have, at EdgeSmart, of course, we have tons of um, specific activities designed to cover each of these standards um, and then build them in throughout everything that we do as teachers with our content to make sure that they're interwoven and supported by all of the science and engineering practices. So, starting off with that first box of investigate and discover the world. For, um, for Texas, it says the student for at least 40% of instructional time will ask questions, identify problems, and plan and safely conduct classroom, laboratory, and field investigations. So that's the point of these first set of skills. And this is the beefy section. Like this section right here is, take a deep breath. There's a lot to take in. Um, this is where a lot of the, the, the real practice is going to happen. Now, that was the same in our, our process skills that we have uh, currently. So it's not necessarily a huge change, but there is a lot more depth to these practices than there ever have been previously. Now, I don't expect you to be able to read it uh, exactly like I have it up here. I'm going to go ahead and go into um, the EdgeSmart system, our LMS, so that you can hopefully see these a little easier uh, with the vertical alignment. <clears throat> Let me zoom in a little bit, make it a little bigger for you. So when we are talking about these first set of skills, um, 1A through 1H, um, this is how do our students learn about the world? How are we going to teach them about the world? We don't just want to, we know that sitting lecture, taking notes is not maybe the best way to learn. Having the students actually do the investigation and create the investigation is really, really important. Um, so asking questions starts from the very beginning and builds as you go through up to biology. So here we're uh, in kindergarten, we start by asking questions. Um, notice it says specifically scientific questions and define engineering problems. And then it gives you a lot of places you can find those from. 
And that continues basically all the way up through fourth grade. And then we just switch to asking questions and defining problems. So it becomes more broad. By the time they get to fifth grade, we want them to have that built in ability to question the world around them. Um, and so that may be questioning anything that they see. We want to be, them to be able to take that skill and apply it to other, um, other applications in their lives. Um, for the secondary skills, the 1A uh, is going to then, we still continue just to ask questions and define problems. And this is based on observations, text, phenomenon models, or um, investigations. And these are investigations that they are going to plan and conduct themselves. So that's a little scary for, um, for us as teachers sometimes. But um, the asking questions, like this is one of those skills that really needs to be just built into absolutely everything that you do. And it can be scary for a teacher that we're inviting our kids to question everything we do. But, you, but that is going to be kind of the shift. And in the, uh, the last section of the session today, we'll be talking about um, practical applications and how to actually start your year off in the classroom. And one of the, the best ways to start your year off is by saying, please question everything, including me. Like, if you want to know how I'm uh, explaining this or why I'm using this fact, ask me, question it. I would be happy to either tell you, I don't know, let's find out together, or show you where I got my information from or tell you about how that information came up. So um, we can't be afraid of being questioned and we also can't be afraid of saying, I don't know, let's find out together. Um, especially as the content is changing in 2024 and some of that new content that we may not be super comfortable with. Like I taught life science for a very, very long time and now the new standards are gonna have a lot more you know, physics and chemistry and earth science built in, well, that that's okay for me to say, you know what, this is kind of new for me too, let's find out together. So we can't be afraid to do that part. Um, again, it's consistent really through all the grade bands. This one is specifically we're building up through um, just building in that practice of being able to ask questions. And I, I think this is a skill that our students have lost a little bit. Um, I know my students last year were, um, this was a challenge to get them to ask questions or to find problems. And we, when we say problems, we don't mean necessarily something that has to be fixed. It could just be a condition that is that exists out there. Um, a problem can be anything from uh, I want to, you know, cross the street and it's really busy to, um, you know, solving world hunger. So it's it's hard for them to necessarily understand that piece of it. We also are going to be giving you um, actual question prompts that you can use with your students. You will receive a copy of this slide deck um, and a copy of the recording for attending today. We'll also send links to the vertical alignment document that I just showed you, so you'll have that vertical alignment. Um, and this, this way you can start to think about how do I get my my kids thinking this way? So for each of these engineering practice, science and engineering practices, you're going to get question prompts that help you as a teacher to start getting that out of your students. Like what we need is what's in their head to come uh, out of their their mouth in the way that we want it to, specifically for what we are looking for as far as you know content. So these question prompts are for you as the teacher to start getting them to ask questions. And again, it needs to be scientific questions. So I like the second one where it says, how can you rephrase that to make it more testable? The testable piece is a big one because I can say, you know, what is the best flower that's out there? And that's very subjective. It's a question and it's one your students might come up with, but it's, it's not really testable unless I add more specific parameters. What is the best flower for a bee to pollinate from. I mean, there's there's ways you can make it testable, but we need to start driving down to the students to make that something that is scientific as far as um, when they're asking questions, we don't want them wandering off too far. And this will be hardest on our little teachers, our littlest 
teachers for kindergarten through second grade, you know, they're going to have some, we haven't really driven that um, ability to ask questions out of them at this point. So um, they're going to have some great questions. How do you guide them towards making it testable? Um, same thing with engineering problems. We need to really define it specifically. And teaching STEM, this was really, really hard for the students. Like, what are you trying to solve? What specifically are you trying to create here? Tell me what your constraints are. Like, that having them think about big picture is difficult for the students. Um, the second practice B is plan and conduct investigations. And notice it says plan investigations. So this one's going to be tough because we, as teachers, like things under our control. Like, I don't like feeling out of control in my classroom, and I don't like not knowing what's going to happen. So if you'll notice in that, um, that TED Talk that we explored earlier, the teacher led them into an investigation where he did not know what they were going to be investigating. He, like, specifically, he had the bees, but the kids came up with a question. And he didn't know if they were going to find any solutions. They didn't know if it was going to work. They didn't know what would happen with this um, investigation that they were doing. And that would be really, really tough as a teacher. So um, in practical application, they need to be able to plan their own investigations. But you need to scaffold this. So in kindergarten, yes, they are going to plan an investigation, but I can help them with that by providing an outline maybe of um, what are some steps that we might need to take to look at this specific piece of content. So it doesn't have to be like just a free for all. And I think that's one of our key takeaways for today is that you don't have to very broadly um, just throw it at the kids and have them say, here you go. Take pieces of each of these and work through each piece of the science and engineering practice um, and then build that capacity. So we want them thinking and acting like scientists, but that doesn't mean they have their, you know, full-on scientists in kindergarten or second grade. We're going to build that capacity up so that by the time they graduate, they have a better ability to actually conduct their own analysis and investigations. So we really want them to have your that support of a graphic organizer or um, build in, like I said, build in the steps. So you give them the question and then they think of how I could investigate that question. Like you don't have to just open it up to like that TED talk at the beginning, everything is up to the kids. That's a very, very extreme on one side of the example, a cookie cutter lab would be on the other end of that spectrum. So we wanna be somewhere in between, depending on the grade and the ability of our students. And as we implement the this, these new practices, we're building up to it, because it's gonna be just as new for your kids as it is for you. Our kids come into science class expecting to learn content and be asked to then regurgitate that content. And that's not what we're asking them to do anymore once we start with these new science and engineering practices. What we're asking them to do now is think for themselves, not learn facts and tell me facts. Big change, big shift. And some of our kids are really gonna be resistant to that. So um, once they get into it, once they start doing it, it's so much more engaging for the kids. They want to be curious, they want to do, that's, that's who kids are, but we've kind of beat it out of them because of our standards. So um, it's a really great way to make them more engaged once we get to the point of being able to really um, start using these practices. So you'll notice um, just the progression here going from um, planning and conducting simple descriptive investigations and then up to six through bio, it's descriptive, comparative, and experimental investigations. All grade levels are asked to design solutions to engineering problems. That's now part of your standards, or will be in 2024. So that means that they need to be creating solutions, and we have to include that engineering piece. Doesn't mean they have to be building something on every single lesson, but we can look at, well, how would you solve that? Or it can be kind of um, conceptual. It doesn't always have to be a physical build. Um, looking at some prompts that would help your students with that. 
Um, what steps would you follow? Maybe I give, especially in the younger grades or as we're learning this, I give you step one, two, and three. What do you think would be the next step? So you're not leaving it entirely just open. You're providing them that scaffold. Um, what tools would you use? Um, how could I test this? If I wanted to test it, and that could be a quick three-minute conversation um, as you're doing you know, a wrap-up or as you're doing a piece of information, you can just go, you know, how could I test that if I wanted to? They've now planned an investigation. It doesn't always have to be really formal and writing it out. It can be just that quick, you know, maybe even an exit ticket. Like, what kind of what kind of investigation would you think would work to test this? Super fast. Doesn't always have to be super formal. Looking at the different type of investigations that we're being uh, asked to do now, there's a lot of different types of investigation. So K-5 is just the descriptive investigation, field investigations, which is a new fun one, and engineering uh, design challenges. So those are the three elementary. Descriptive just means making observations and collecting data. So um, as, like kindergartners, it can be, this is smaller or larger. This is heavier or lighter, um, those kinds of investigations. But we also need to remember um, to that, you know, teaching now or teaching with the 3D model is very phenomenon based. So we're trying to explain phenomenon. So you're giving them something to describe and then asking them to come up with this explanation for it. Um, and so that descriptive piece is really important. Comparative investigation is when you start introducing variables. This happens in sixth grade. So what is the relationship between these two um, phenomenon or these two conditions? So we're asking them to create these type of investigations. They have to be able to plan them out. That means they have to know what variables are and controls and all of that, but it's really um, finding patterns. And this is where um, those recurring themes and concepts that we talked about last week, that's where they can really start to come in. All right, uh, experimental investigations. These involve, now I'm going to create an experiment where um, I may not know the outcome, um, but there's multiple variables. Here's your control, we're analyzing the data. All these happen throughout middle school and in high school. Um, in the new science teach. So um, they have to have a little more complex understanding of those variables. And um, again, the cause and effect, that's one of our recurring themes and concepts, identifying um, patterns, identifying relationships, all of that's built into the recurring themes. So that's how we get that 3D component of teaching going. The engineering design challenges, um, in learning STEM, and my degree is actually in STEM, I found a common misconception around teachers is that when you're doing these engineering design challenges, it tends to be a big, huge project, and it's gonna take several weeks to build through it. Um, it doesn't have to be. It can be a very simple challenge. It can be um, as complex as you want it to be. I think some of the keys that we wanna focus on is that it is a process just like doing science is a process. It's not, I'm gonna design something and I'm done, right? We need to go through that process of iteration where we're creating more than one design and they refine their designs and they critique their designs and they critique other people's designs very um, supportively, <laughs> but they do, they need to look at it and go, you know what, I'm not sure that would work because Maybe if you fix this component, it would help. Um, and then we redesign it and we test again and we redesign it and test again. And that can be done um, in a drawing. It can be done physically. It can be done using cardboard and Play-Doh. Like it doesn't have to be a super uh, extended project. It can be done very simply, but um, they need to be building. So we want them designing, we want them creating, and we want them testing that. At EdgeSmart, what we did is one per reporting category. So understanding that our time is absolutely precious, but this has to be addressed. And you can use a lot of 
different practices within that engineering design challenge. Um, they're planning their investigations. They're they're uh, analyzing their data. They can create models that like with one design challenge, you can use, you can do a lot of different skills, check a lot of different boxes on those science and engineering practices. So maybe once per reporting category is plenty. Now within your content, your scope and sequence, if you have time for more, that would be amazing. Um, if you have time for less, then do it once every semester, once every six weeks or nine weeks, depending on your schedule. Uh, and count on it just taking a little bit more time as you may, like 10 minutes of class time here, 20 minutes of class time here. Um, you can do that throughout. It doesn't have to be like, okay, the next three days we're gonna spend building something. So you can make this very flexible depending on how much time you have, but they have to be building. And sometimes it can be as simple as, how would I solve this problem? Draw a picture, exit ticket. And you're done, you've got that. Um, there can be a lot of flexibility there. Field investigations is a new uh, component for us. And this is where we need to take them out of the classroom into a real world setting. Um, something authentic where they're, they're actually outside or you know uh, in a place where they can do real science, where they're collecting observations, um, collecting data, making charts, making graphs. Um, this could be any component of your content can really be adapted for a field investigation. Uh, we do have to amp up the safety a little bit here. Like if you're taking your kids outside, um, be aware of any allergies that the students might have. Uh, make sure you're in a safe place, all of that kind of thing. Um, but the like bee stings or um, those kind of allergies could become a real factor if you're doing a lot of investigations outside doesn't have to be outdoors. It can just be in a real world setting. Um, so maybe you take them to the cafeteria to run, you know, different kinds of experiments with force and pushing objects and how things work that way. Um, but it's great when you can get them outside. It's, it's so uh, authentic. It makes the learning more authentic for the students. Um, and there's so many different things that you can investigate in an outside setting. Simulations and virtual investigations are also great for being able to um, help our students understand things that maybe would be difficult if they were uh, right in front of them. So as a life science teacher, one thing that would that works really well with these kind of simulations is anything that takes time, like growing plants. Uh, we would grow bean plants every year like you're supposed to because it shows turgor pressure and all the geotropism and great stuff like that, which is awesome. But, you know, inevitably things would happen. Some would grow, some wouldn't. Um, not everyone got the same results, of course. Um, but being able to see those kind of simulations really helps to uh, make sure the students, I don't know, get a little bit of a... Um, a step up on being able to see things that happen over time. Uh, EdgeSmart's awesome at being able to have those simulations. If you're um, one of our current customers, you know our simulations are incredible and they really take them through the entire process of doing science. They, they ask questions, they complete their hypothesis, they use claim evidence reasoning for being able to, um, for being able to help connect their um, their learning and their evidence to being able to explain their reasoning. So, and I apologize for the misspelling. I'm gonna say I finished the, the last couple slides on here um, kind of on an airplane. And so, um, yeah, there, there may be some definite punctuation errors as well, I've noticed, but uh, I will fix those before I send them out. So if you wanna share these with anyone, you can. Um, so those are the different types of investigations we need to have the students not only uh, executing, not only carrying out, but actually planning them as well and figuring out how would I do this. The next couple are business as usual. So safety, huge issue, but it really hasn't changed at all. Tools, um, there are specific changes within the tools. 
as far as what grade level is going to do what. So it's really important to know what tools you are expected to have your students know, but that just depends on grade level. All it is is using scientific tools and engineering tools. Um, and then E, 1E is observation and measurement. Um, make sure you're using, you know, the international system. Uh, there's a, an emphasis on using data as evidence. So we need to kind of work that into our vernacular. We want that to be, um, when we're talking about data, we're talking about evidence. That's either evidence that proves or supports your claim or evidence that does not support your claim. And both of those are really good data. Like kids do tend to have a misconception that it needs to support what they're saying. And that's not true. We want to learn that evidence that shows it's not true is just as important as evidence that shows that this is um, a true factor, a statement that works. Um, and then of course, quantitative and qualitative data, evidence. The last one for all grade levels is a doozy. <laughs> so um, this is collecting data. And in kindergarten through second grade, we're recording and or organizing data using pictures, numbers, words, symbols, and simple graphs. So this doesn't say yet that they have to construct their own, but they need to be able to use a graph to represent the information that they're collecting. Um, and so that can kind of be a little bit of a challenge, but we need to build that capacity into them as much as possible by second grade, because in third grade, they not only have to use those graphs and charts, they actually have to construct their own. So they have to choose the appropriate um, type of graphic organizer to collect their data. And notice the including, it says including tables, bar graphs, line graphs, tree maps, concept maps, Venn diagrams, flow charts, or sequence maps, and input output tables that show cause and effect. That's a lot, right? So throughout your year, we want to make sure that we're using different types of graphic organizers and the students need to understand why you would choose a Venn diagram over a line graph for this particular data that you've collected. So we, we need to help them understand these different types of graphic organizers. Now it says to construct their own. That doesn't mean we can't help them understand which one is best. Um, so you can actually, as you're going through the different pieces of contact, say, okay, this is where we're going to use a Venn diagram because, and you're showing them, you're letting them create their own Venn diagram as far as maybe what goes in each piece, but we're really helping them to understand why you're choosing it. Then in middle levels, we go through, they have to construct their own um, and map out like their own data as they plan their investigation. They're using and constructing and choosing the appropriate way of representing that data, the appropriate graphic organizer to organize their data. Because by the time they get to high school, they have to then um, amp it up again and it says organize quantitative and qualitative data using scatter plots, line graphs, bar graphs, charts, data tables, digital tools, diagrams, scientific drawings, and student prepared models. So at that point, they're taking in all this different types of data and understanding and being able to choose the best representation of it to use. So this is, this is um, a big change as far as how we were collecting data, as far as the actual standard requirement um, and being able to check this off that yes, you have covered this because there's a lot to cover, especially third through fifth grade. That's like um, a lot of different types of maps and graphs and charts. So um, so really be aware of like intentional where you can fit this in best. There's obviously things that are going to work for different concepts like flow charts and sequence maps. We cover that in um, food webs every day. That's great. Um, Venn diagrams, there's lots of easy ways to do that um, throughout the year, but you need to be intentional in where are you going to place each of these types of data collection within a, um, within a content sequence or within your scope and sequence. There is 
um, some great ways to get your kids thinking about these, uh, these topics. What patterns do you see? What patterns tend to lend themselves to certain types of um, graphic representation? Um, is the, and this last one I think is really important um, because we want them learning all these different types and being able to identify what is the best one to use. So is there more than one type that you could have used? Um, maybe is there one that's better or not? And this could be used for argumentation. If you have groups who choose different types of um, graphic organizers to represent their data, they could have to justify that. Have that conversation of why did you choose that? Which one do you think works? most effectively. We want to get away from the idea of this one is the right one and this one is the wrong one. We want it to be better, worse, kind of uh, have that, does it does it do a really good job of representing the data? Does this one have problems that maybe it doesn't show all the data? That kind of thing. Um, there's not always a right or wrong answer as far as how they're representing their data. Um, and then the last one that we're going to talk about before we take a break, so we're, we're going to take a break here in just a minute, um, in middle school and above, so starting in sixth grade, uh, no wait, I'm sorry, this is not the one, this one is for all grade levels, so, and it's actually uh, standard across the grade levels, this one's huge, and it is develop and use models to represent phenomenon systems or solutions to engineering problems. The students were expected, of course, to use models, but now they have to make their own. So what is a model? <clears throat> when we taught uh, catastrophic events in seventh grade of my classes, we had Volcano Day. Um, and we actually gave them a, um, a choice board that had like nine different ways that they could show their understanding of catastrophic events. And um, inevitably, we would get like 10 volcanoes uh, per class period, and then there was some really great models, and then there was just the kids who wanted to pour vinegar and um, baking soda and make a something go boom. Um, this in and of itself is not a model, right? Until you start explaining the pieces of it, the parts of it, um, it's not a model. This is a very limited representation of a volcano. So, it would need a lot of context. It would need captions. It would need explanation. It would need the pieces and the parts broken down in order to make it an effective model. So that was really hard to get across to the kids. They built a volcano. They made it go and it erupt. What do you mean that's not a model? Um, we really need to answer what do we consider a model? This is another example. This is a great model. Obviously, this is a Bohr model of, um, of an atom, and it, it shows a lot of information, but it also has a lot of limitations. <clears throat> um, it's static, for one thing. It doesn't show that those orbital uh, lines are actually a cloud and that, you know, there's a lot of movement there and, you know, things kind of break down after you get through the first 20 elements. And um, there's a lot of limitations. So while we can provide and help them to understand a model like this, we really need to make sure um, that when we're introducing models, we're explaining what is a model, what makes a good model, and then using that model often. So a model is simply a representation of a complex idea. It does not have to be anything big, huge, grand every time. It can be very simple. It can be a simple little sketch. It can be a 3D construction, a computer simulation, some kind of mathematical equation or representation. But it has to have um, all the relative components and it has to be used to explain something. So this first picture here of a cute little blue fish is not a model, right? It's a drawing. It's a representation, but it's still not a model because it doesn't have the relative components annotated. This makes it a model. So when we're talking about models in the scientific context, we really need to, um, as we are introducing this topic for the first time that they're making a model, do some direct teach on what is a model, why is this a model, why is this not a model, and kind of make sure that they understand what is expected. Um, 
and the earliest grade levels can do this. A drawing is a great model. Um, there could be an argument for a model even being just conceptual. Um, they don't necessarily even have to have it put down on paper as long as they can understand it and articulate it um, in their in their writing or in their you know, like an oral narrative. Um, but we they need to understand what exactly is a model. So to create these models, um, to get the students thinking about their model, we really want to, there's the next step is they create their model, but they also have to understand the limitations and um, the problems within a model. So we want them to think about how, okay, so how can you create a model that represents this? Um, are there certain materials you can use? Are there certain ways that you could um, represent it on paper that are better than others? And then how can you modify it? How could I change it to make it more accurate? Great question um, from Lori. So the um, relative components, that can be different for every model. So let's look back here. What would be the relative components that would make this an actual model? Well, there has to be some content, some concept and some context behind it, right? This right now is a cone with red stuff coming out. So for me to turn this into a model, it might require, um, maybe I could put a board behind it and explain what each piece of it is. Um, again, a model has to be used to explain a scientific concept. So at this point, this is just, you know, fuzzing. I would need to explain what the um, baking, pow baking powder and, I'm sorry, baking soda and um, vinegar represent and how them coming out of the volcano represent an eruption. I might want to include what are the um, pieces of the model represent. So what is the cone? What is the red stuff? Why is it open at the top? Why is it bigger at the bottom? How does this occur in nature? Uh, as you get up in grade levels, you might want to start adding things like, um, what are the limitations of this? Well, it doesn't represent all volcanoes. Not all volcanoes look like this. Um, if you're in earth science, you might want to have them explain how is this formed, um, what happens to make this. So those kind of like concept pieces around it is what makes it those 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 important components that make it a model. Um, again, here I would need a key to understand what do the red things represent, what do the lines represent, what does that big black circle in the middle represent. Like this in and of itself. If you know chemistry, you know exactly what you're looking at. If I've never seen chemistry before, then it's just, you know, red dots and some lines. So it would need that context. I would need to label each piece and give an explanation. And that can be done verbally or it could be done um, in writing or, like I said, with a key. You know, they could have a little key that says the red is this, the black is this, the line represents this just depending on grade level and how sophisticated a model they need to be making. Um, this is a model be in, in this specific case because it's labeling each of the components of the fish itself. This is a great little fish, but it doesn't give me any context for the components of the fish. Um, I also I included this slide and included this link um, because modeling honestly deserves its own session. Like you could do a three hour workshop on modeling and it would um, it would be it would still not be enough. So modeling is a huge component here. Um, our content director, she is amazing content and curriculum, and she did a great webinar called Taking the Mystery Out of Modeling. So this is a link to that webinar. Um, if you are interested in modeling, this is a really good way to get some excellent background um, and some other practical applications of how to create models, how to have your students start creating their own models. Um, so there's a link to the workshop in this slide deck. And almost there, there is one more. This is what I was aiming for, um, sixth grade through biology. There is an H. <laughs> And this is new as well. Um, and it is distinguished between a hypothesis, a, theory, a scientific theory, and a scientific law. 
Um, and of course, the hypothesis, proposed explanation or prediction theory is well substantiated. And then a law is something that we know works every single time it's ever been tested. Um, sometimes I think, I think from my experience, a hypothesis students get, we're kind of okay with that, but the difference between a theory and a law is where things get a little fuzzy for them. Um, at what point does a theory become a law? And how do we know a law and, and what's the difference? So this is where it's gonna become a little more um, explicit teach for them. And we do have a couple of examples of what that would look like. Um, the theory of relativity, is awesome, but you, it's hard to be able to test 100%, right? There's there's no way. Right, exactly. Cell theory, we know cell theory works on every, um, every time it's been tested, but it's still a theory. Why is that not a law when the law of conservation of energy is a law? It's a big struggle. And, um, and now it's part of our standards to really have that explicit teach. So, it's hard to know exactly when to work this in to the content. It really needs to be brought in over and over and over again. So you could help them understand theory when you're doing cell theory. And then as we move on to other content, um, talking about energy and things like that, you know, explain those difference of law. And it's gonna have to be built in over and over and over again. Um, there are some question prompts again, for helping them to understand, you know, work through this and construct this knowledge themselves. Because again, that's kind of what we, what we really want them to be able to do is think about how these are different and be able to find the evidence for that themselves. So what evidence is there that this is a law? What evidence is there that this is a theory? So this is giving you just some um, questions that, can help the students as they start thinking through that process. So um, we are gonna take a break. Before we take a break, does anybody have any questions on what we've covered so far? Like I said, this, uh, this first one is big and beefy. Like this is huge. Um, one A through H is like, a big part of the standards and it is a big change and it's a big shift in the way that we think. So uh, the others are not quite as beefy as what this one is. But yeah, it, please, uh, if you have any questions over the break, we're going to take about 10 minutes. Um, so it's 10.04, let's come back at 10.15. And uh, if you have any questions, you've come up with any questions, please place them in the chat or you can ask as soon as we get back. All right, y'all, it is 10.15. So we're going to uh, keep plowing through these science and engineering practices. And again, we're gonna spend some time um, right around 11 talking about some more practical applications, way that we can really integrate them into what we're already doing. Because this is, we're looking ahead for next year, the 2024 implementation, but these are things you can start doing now to build that capacity in our students. Um, all of those skills that we talked about, you know, constructing models, asking questions, um, those are just going to take some time to build in. Um, planning and carrying out investigations, that's tough. Um, that was a great question in the chat about um, how to make this applicable for our youngest learners. I mean, how do you have a kindergartner carrying out and planning their own investigation? Um, it really can be simplified for those younger learners just by um, our, as a teaching strategy, we are taking the step back and instead of showing them for, I, I used an example of um, the, uh, the properties of objects, um, instead of telling them, notice this, notice, like giving them a bunch of objects and so I notice the difference between them, giving them a bunch of objects and having them tell you what the differences are. They can start breaking it up into different categories. Um, so if I have you know, a rock, a piece of wood and a leaf, how can we um, categorize these? How, what are the differences between them? One group may choose to uh, organize those objects in one way, another group in another way. And by having them try and explain that, you've now introduced this, that section of argumentation. 
They can create models of their thinking um, simply by drawing like a three column chart and putting the actual physical object in that chart. And then maybe we can add some other objects that they could um, begin to evaluate. Does this fit into the first column or the second column or the third column? Um, it will take scaffolding. It will take building that capacity in for the kids. Um, it's not gonna be intuitive necessarily. But like we saw at the beginning in the TED talk that we walked, um, experimentation is play, right? So if we introduce it as play, so if we allow them to play with these objects, they're going to be able to sort them, to um, identify them, to name properties of them. One group may separate them by color. One may separate them by size. You know, there's all kinds of different ways that they can do that, and they're identifying physical properties. So um, it's allowing them to have that time to explore and investigate in a way that you choose and with that support, knowing what uh, standard you're trying to get them to understand. So um, we'll talk more practical kind of applications uh, as we go through, but I do want to introduce you to the next three categories. We're going to go through these a little bit more quickly. Um, honestly, again, each of these could have their own three-hour workshop session. There's just so much to unpack in these standards. Um, so we're going to take a quick look at the vertical alignment for each of them, the pieces of it, and then um, how we can kind of implement that along with the question prompts again. Um, so standard two, uh, this is two, I think it's A through C on this one, is data analysis. Um, so the student analyzes and interprets data to drive meaning, identify features and patterns, and discover relationships. And all of this has to be based on evidence. So this, the, um, the key takeaway here for this category, I think, is what is your evidence? So our kids need to be able to understand what evidence is and how to use it. Um, is the fact that you think it's true really evidence? Is the fact that your friend said it really evidence? Or is the data really evidence? You know what I mean? They need to understand that difference because if you're on Facebook or any kind of social media, you understand that not everyone understands what evidence is, right? Uh, well, I heard it on Facebook, so it must be true. We have adults who don't understand what evidence is. We really need that to build in that capacity for our kids to know and be able to use data as evidence. This is the vertical alignment across kindergarten. So we have K, uh, this is A through D. So the first one is the same across all grade levels, all the way up through bio, identify basic advantages and limitations of models, such as their size, their properties, and materials. We looked at a model, well, a semi-model um, of a volcano. So the limitations there would simply be things like, is that a representation of all volcanoes? Um, does it show you how big they really are? Does it show you the inner workings of it? I mean, there's always ways that we can improve a model. Um, and so we just need to be asking these questions. And the students need to be asking these questions. Um, they need to be evaluating each other's models and say, does that represent um, the actual scientific concept that we're trying to get across? Um, and there's lots of ways that you can introduce that. We'll give you those question prompts as we go through. Um, analyzing data. Again, we're looking for things like patterns and significant features. So those are recurring themes. We're weaving back in those recurring themes from last week. That's 3D teaching. Um, and analyzing data doesn't always, I mean, we think of data as being, oh, Maybe this is just me. We think of data tend to be like numbers and figures and um, and things that are sometimes really concrete, but it doesn't have to be necessarily only anything like that. It can be just their observations. Um, noticing the the way the sky looks every day is data, right? We're we're noticing concrete evidence of changes in the atmosphere by looking at the sky every day. So really analyzing what does that mean in the context of a pattern or significant features. Um, mathematical uh, concepts, mathematical thinking 
and um, computational thinking is new. Uh, it's kind of always been built into what we did, but now it's being articulated separately. And now they also have to evaluate objects, evaluate a design or object using specific criteria. And notice that's even down at the lowest grade level. Kindergarten says evaluate a design or object using criteria to determine if it worked as intended. Um, so they're making their own designs and then they're evaluating their own designs. We're teaching them from the very beginning to use critical thinking skills to evaluate does this work or not work. And again, it kind of is a relative scale. We don't necessarily want to say that's a bad design. Right? We want to say that is maybe not the best design. This design might work better. Or how can we change it to make it work better or to make it fit this uh, occasion better, this use better? Um, so, you know, we really want to make that shift from this is the right answer to this is the best answer we have right now. So this is not maybe the best design, but this is the, the best way we can do it for now um, because things are changing and we need to change, uh, we need to build in that ability for our students to really change with it. And I'll say I'm guilty of that. Pluto is a planet. Um, when I was in school, we learned that Pluto is a planet. It will always be a planet for me because I learned science by fact, right? I was taught concept after concept. I learned the concept. I spit it back at my teacher when I did the uh, test and I got an A or I got a C or whatever. Um, and that's not how we want them doing science now. We want them thinking through it themselves, evaluating it themselves. At the upper grade levels, not much changes here. You'll notice um, I, we're still identifying the exact same models, um, limitations of models, identifying data. We do add some, um, some additional uh, constraints. And then we're still using mathematical calculations um, and how that they are thinking and evaluating experimental and engineering designs. Um, and this is a big change that evaluating experimental design. So if you'll notice D, at the younger grade levels, um, we're just evaluating it to see if it works. We're evaluating it using specific criteria. Now we're going to evaluate it to see, is that the best way we could have tested that? Is there a, a better way we could have designed a feature? Um, are there better tools we could have used as measurement tools? Like maybe you're using a, a meter stick and it really would have been better if we had something longer uh, and used a measuring tape instead. Um, we're evaluating not only does it work, but is that the best way to do it? So we've, we're trying to build in that capacity for them to critically evaluate and understand that progression from better to worse. Um, so analyzing data starts with kindergarten. They just need to be able to identify significant features and patterns. Moving to third through fifth grade, we also introduce sources of error. Um, is, is there something that could have gone wrong in our data that makes it look like that? Six through eighth, now we're changing it to significant descriptive statistical features. So instead of just significant features, we want them to be specifically statistical. So we're using that data, we're using math now, we wanna look at charts and graphs, um, and we are adding in limitations. And then by biology or by high school, we take out descriptive, so it's just significant statistical features and limitations. Um, so there's a little bit of a change there. So again, it's that evaluation component of, does is this the best way we could have looked at it? Um, growing, growing bean plants maybe is a good example. So we wanna analyze the data and say the plants, we can set up an experiment where some plants get sunlight and some plants don't, or as much sunlight, maybe a, you know several different patterns along there. And then we can look for sources of error. Well, uh, these plants didn't get as much water. So that's not really a fair experiment. That wasn't the best way we could have tested this um, because there was that element of error. So we're really teaching them to evaluate how was the, the experiment conducted 
and is that the best way to do it? And what that leads to later is them being able to look at data and say, you know what, this, um, this sneaker commercial that says nine out of 10 people uh, think this is the best sneaker that was ever invented, that this study was paid for by Nike, and their data says, of course, Nike is the best sneaker, they can look at that critically and say, that was not a great experiment. It's like, I wonder who they asked. They, they really are looking at that, that component of it and being able to evaluate it. We're creating these little citizens who can really understand how that scientific process worked and whether it was done correctly or not. Um, there's a ton of questions we can start using to help them analyze their data. There's, I mean, 10 questions here that you can start embedding in your teaching. Um, what conclusions can you draw? Are there similarities or differences? Um, just asking, what do you see? Not how do you interpret what are you seeing, but what do you see? Like actually have them point out in the graph, in the data, in the uh, whatever you're observing, what is it you are actually seeing? Well, I'm seeing that there's a lot more red dots in this particular place. Okay, what does that tell you? Like actually have them point out what they're seeing first because they tend to jump ahead to the trying to analyze it all. Start with what is actually there um, and get them into the habit of identifying what it is they're seeing. And then we can start to become more sophisticated in that, how does this relate to other things that we've learned? Are there, is there anything we've learned maybe that backs up this evidence that makes it more clear? Cause and effect relationships, putting it in the context of the recurring themes, um, those kinds of questions that can help them go deeper. But starting at our youngest grades, it's, it can really be as simple as what exactly are you seeing? Explain this to me, and then we can move to that analysis part. Um, when we go to, and, and again, I'm just going to show, you know, this is all about that analysis piece um, and how we go from not just uh, looking at our data and making a chart of it, but really deeply analyzing it. And that anal analysis starts even at kindergarten. So there is that mathematical computation. At kindergarten, it can be as simple as smaller or larger, more or less um, is still that mathematical concept that is more grade appropriate. And then as we go up through our grade levels, we're using those calculations to really compare data sets. And though at this grade level, you're also having them start comparative um, experimentation where we set up two, um, two different, like the bean plant example, where we have one in light and one in dark, and we're comparing the outcome of two, th two different things. So um, at that point, you can really start to do a lot with your charts and graphs and data. Um, the category three is uh, communication and critique. And this one's going to be fun for the first couple of years because we're asking our students, again, to develop a new skill. Um, our, I think our language arts and maybe even history teachers have been doing some really great things with um, like Socratic circles and different ways of helping the students learn to talk. Um, but we are really asking them to, to look at what their, their classmates are doing and help them understand if that's a good way of doing it or a, not the best way of doing it, if there's a better way. And so we're going to have to give them the language to do this. We're going to have to show them and model for them how do we um, communicate respectfully and argue respectfully and, um, and critique things that someone else has done in a way that's not um, detrimental. So there's uh, this one kind of stresses me out as a teacher, I will say, because um, I just cringe at the way my students sometimes talk to each other already, and now we're inviting this in, so it really is going to be a skill that they have to learn. Um, so this says the student develops evidence-based explanations and communicates findings, conclusions, and proposed solutions, and specifically that means we're developing our explanations as far as science, and then um, 
supporting uh, creating designs as far as, yes, absolutely. I love that comment. Um, supporting uh, solutions for the engineering components of this. So science, we develop explanations and engineering, we develop solutions. And we don't always have to follow through as far as building that full on model, but you can simply ask, how could I solve this? Or is there something I could create that would solve this? And that can be a three minute you know, exit ticket. Um, but developing explanations is something that the students are doing, right? This, this is one of those places where it's kind of a shift from being very teacher led to being very student led. The students are developing their explanation and it's tough to do. Um, we need to help them to communicate and collaborate. Science and engineering are both very collaborative operations. Scientists do not work in isolation most of the time. We're, you constantly are bouncing ideas off of each other. <coughs> Excuse me, engineers work together. Um, this C is where we get into that whole um, idea of critique where we are listening actively to others' explanation and identifying relevant evidence and then engage respectfully in scientific discussion. And this is important to have them talking. We want them talking. We want them engaging in engaging with that conversation with each other because it's it's so very powerful when it's done right. Um, as we get up into our older grade levels, they are, um, again, they're just developing those explanations, communicating their explanations. And this says, notice, uh, individually and collaboratively. So we it's built into our standards that they are working together to solve things. And then um, engaging respectfully in that scientific argumentation, using evidence. And that's a key part for all of them is being able to use evidence to support their answers. And that's again, where we might need to give them that language. Well, my data showed this particular um, contrast. Another way that this can be done that's really effective, excuse me, let me grab a sip of water real quick, is um, use the class data. So um, most of the time, in my classes, I would have them working in small groups. That tends to be the most effective. Um, three, four students working together um, tends to be perfect if you can do that. So when they have their data, it's a great idea to, as much as possible, develop a full class data. Have each group share their data with you and then create that class um, chart graph, model, whatever it is. And you can project that up on the board. But what you're doing is getting a larger data sample, which helps with their you know, mathematical thinking, that computation, but it also allows for this communication to happen on a whole group level. Each group is contributing their own evidence. They can explain their evidence. They can talk about how they reach that conclusion or explanation. Um, and it allows them to really work through this when you can create a class set of data. <coughs> so that's a powerful tool and it kind of does put you in control of the conversation and the way things are going um, as they are learning the skill of critiquing and giving their evidence and describing it in terms of evidence. Um, Biology goes a little bit deeper into this as far as critiquing other scientific explanations and solutions. Again, they want, by the time they reach high school, the idea here is that they can look at science that has already been done and say, that was a great setup, that was a good experiment, that data is probably really um, valuable, or that experiment was not done well, and it's, you know, five people is not a great data set for this entire experiment and all those kinds of, of um, critical thinking skills. So by the time they reach high school is when they need to be able to do that. That's kind of crazy that we're expecting that from, you know, freshman biology students, um, but they can do it. They can ask those questions and really think about where the experiment is going and what happened with it. Um, but we have to build that capacity throughout. Um, again, yeah, so as was just stated in the chat, one of the most important parts of this is that we 
show from the beginning of the school year, and we'll talk about what the beginning of the school year might look like, um, it needs to be a safe environment where they feel like they can share their ideas and share their thoughts individually and as a group and know that it, they are valued. Um, and so you have to create that respectful environment. Listening is a very tough skill for our students. Uh, it's just tough skill for adults, frankly. Um, people tend to hear what they want to hear or only hear enough to that they're thinking about their response before the person actually finishes talking. Um, so we really want to teach that active listening. How do we listen and teach those skills such as paraphrasing? So what I heard you say is, and then summarize, then making that response back. There's tons of really great resources out there on how to help students engage in conversation. Um, EdgeSmart on our webinar series, we had several about you know student talk and things. So I, I encourage you to go out. This could be a, another whole topic in and of itself is how do we get students engaging in respectful scientific discourse? Um, some of the other keys though are make sure it's a real world topic. Like it needs to be something authentic that they can really dig their teeth into. And then how do you giving them those tools for feedback? Maybe have sentence stems as a model. I mean, as an anchor chart on your wall. Like have those sentence stems until they're comfortable knowing how to provide feedback. Teach the difference between constructive feedback and um, and critique, right? We want constructive feedback based on evidence. We don't just want them, you know, dissing their friends or however you want to say it. Um, and then the other thing is we really want to celebrate that. I love number 10 where it says celebrate diverse perspectives. Um, we need to understand that everyone's coming at it from their own viewpoint and that they have, there's some, a lot of value that comes at comes about from having all those different perspectives and different backgrounds and different experiences. And if we really celebrate that, it helps to create that respectful environment. So they all kind of feed back and forth um, from each other. <laughs> so these are just a few tips to get you started, um, but this is gonna be one that, you know, that we can really develop as we go. Uh, one way to do this is, and one of my favorite ways here is, um, through claim evidence reasoning. So we're making a claim, we need to develop our evidence and then follow through with how did I reach this conclusion based on the evidence. Uh, there's lots of ways of doing this. If you haven't seen this commercial, I'm gonna go ahead and show you Cheryl's she shed. Well, it finally happened, Zachary. Somebody burned down my she shed. Nobody burned down your she shed, Cheryl. Well, my she shed's on fire. Your she shed was struck by lightning. Zachary, is my she shed covered by State Farm? Your she shed's covered, Cheryl. You hear that, Victor? I'm getting a new she shear she shed. She shear? Mm-hmm. That's wonderful news. Go with the one that's here to help. Okay. Uh, so in a lot of uh, forums and things that I'm in, this is a great way to introduce that claim evidence reasoning. So who burned down Cheryl's she shed? There's a lot of arguments you could make here. Uh, some people would say that the husband burned down the she shed because um, he was not a huge fan of it, just based on his response. Like I can make different arguments for someone really did burn it down or it was struck by lightning. Why would I think maybe it wasn't struck by lightning? Well, if I look through the commercial, there's not really a storm around or anything. Like there's a lot of arguments that could be made here. Um, and if I use something like this, and of course it doesn't have to be the specific one, but if I use something like this that is um, kind of am ambiguous, that has a lot of different conclusions, I can really show how those different perspectives can make, um, it can make a, for a richer discussion around something that is occurring. So this can be a basis for how to use that argumentation feature. Uh, we, it's it's gonna be tough change for our students, but we can walk them through it. It's again, just working on scaffolding. So, um, this is a great one if you if you search out there there's a ton of like lesson plans that actually go with this it's just a fun way of introducing 
different perspectives and being able to argue from evidence what happened in a situation. So we really have to find that evidence of why do you think that? Um, and again, here's some question prompts and it's basically, why do you think that? What evidence can you provide? Evidence is data. So we're looking for data to be able to um, support our claim. And um, it, you know, for the youngest learners, we probably would not use that terminology, obviously. Um, evidence should be introduced early though, like using that term evidence. Why do you say that? And understand that when I say, why do you say that? I'm looking for what evidence did you provide? Um, why do you say that, uh, you know, chickens come from eggs? Well, I've seen what this evidence is, um, what videos, I've seen the life cycle. There's so many different ways that you can use that, but they can, um, looking at life cycles, provide evidence based on what they've been introduced to. As they become more sophisticated in it, you might look for the alternate explanations, counter arguments, or um, getting ahead of that. Like by the time they're in high school, they really need to be able to think through what other arguments are out there to be able to show how theirs is going to be in relation to that. Um, the last piece is the science and research piece where the student knows the contribution of scientists and recognizes the importance of scientific research and innovation on society. There's a lot of breakouts that go with this. And I'm gonna take you into EdgeSmart in just a few minutes and we're just gonna explore a little bit showing how that can be done. Um, there's only two standards that go with this. Explain, and I like in kindergarten, we're looking for specific scientists. Um, all we need to be able to do is explain how science or innovations can help others. And then each year in kindergarten through second grade, they chose different scientists or engineers to look at. Um, so we need to introduce these people because it is, it says such as, meaning it has to be those specific individuals as well as others. Uh, Isaac Newton, Mae Jemison, and I always pronounce this one wrong, wrong but Inez uh, Mejia. So we're looking through a range of diverse scientists and engineers throughout those early years. And then after we go through second grade, it becomes um, much more broad to look at people as well as other resources that have impacted science. Um, and it specifically talks about using other resources. This is a great place to reach out to universities or um, businesses that are near you to form those kind of partnerships. Uh, NASA, NOAA, uh, the government organizations, the National Weather Service, they're amazing. All the like zoos, um, even if like I taught in a very rural school and, and we're 30, 45 minutes from the nearest big city, um, you can have people zoom in. There's opportunities to have a scientist come in and work with your students on particular um, topics. So look at those museums out there. They will often do live tours, live Zoom tours. Like we didn't have the resources to be able to take our kids to a museum, but I can sure have that museum come in or I can do a virtual tour of the museum in a lot of different ways to incorporate that. Um, so find those, reach out to your community. It's amazing, you know, those connections that you can make to be able to bring people into your classroom. Uh, one way we did this is through um, the Civil Air Patrol. If you're not a member of Civil Air Patrol, that's a really great one. Uh, we actually did have a helicopter pilot, a jet pilot, and then a helicopter mechanic that came into my classroom, even in the middle of nowhere, and uh, talked and worked with my students on aviation, uh, different kinds of concepts in a STEM class. And they were able to help them create paper airplanes. And we talked about helicopter. It was awesome. Civil Air Patrol is, it's like a $25 membership for a lifetime membership. And then you can reach out and have all kinds of resources. So I highly recommend that if you are not already a member, there's lots of stuff they have available that, um, that can provide resources for a classroom. And inc that includes 
people actually coming in, as well as other types of resources you can use. So this is now a requirement for us is to be able to reach out and make those community connections. Before it was like, that's kind of cool and to be able to do it if you can, if you have that opportunity, but it really is gonna become a requirement. Um, and that goes up through the highest grade levels. Notice there is, um, here's where we really get into that, make informed decisions by evaluating evidence from multiple appropriate sources to assess the credibility, accuracy, cost effectiveness, and methods used. Um, a lot of breakouts in that, again, talking about cost effectiveness, like um, a cost benefit analysis at that grade level is pretty tough because a lot of kids don't have a really good uh, concept of money and that relative amounts of money. Um, and so it it's tough to be able to get that across to them. Um, but there's a lot of research that you can do, bringing in current um, research that's going on right now. Uh, this would be an amazing place to bring in citizen science activities. Um, we wanted to mention that too. If you go out and like do a Google search for citizen science, there's all kinds of really great uh, science investigations that are going on that scientists are performing that they need the public's help with. And it may be something like um, the students would go out and look for a certain number of birds. They want to find the migratory pattern of these birds. And if you're in that path, they want people to go out and identify every time they see that bird. But it's actual scientific research that's going on that the public can help with. One I heard about recently was really cool. It was um, People are taking images from Mars, from the Mars rover. These images that they're getting, there's so much data with them. And they're training AI to be able to look for different features. So you can go in and look at those images and point out different features. And you're actually helping the computer to learn how to look and analyze data. There's tons of different citizen science research projects out there. Find one that relates to the topic you're on, or maybe again, one per reporting category or one per six weeks or semester and become involved and have your students become involved in actual science that is going on. Um, and it brings it home for them. It makes it real life. It helps them to understand it in a real world context. Um, for this critical evaluation piece, we really need them to look at all factors of a claim. Um, so the evidence and the data, but not only that, but how was the data collected? So those research methods, um, using what they've already taken from models, like learning about the limitations of models, talk about sample size, um, consensus, conflict of interest. Again, that Nike um, funding a study that says Nike's the best shoe, that's a conflict of interest. You know, have them really think through all of these um, types of ideas. And even as I'm saying this, I can hear, you know, we already have so much that we're working on. We already have so much content that we're trying to teach. And now we need to bring in this type of critical evaluation. It is tough, but break it down into bite-sized pieces. So not everything has to be done on these every single time. Maybe in one experiment, we point out a possible conflict of interest. In another one, we talk about how the research was done. Like, this doesn't have to be all at once. It doesn't have to be every single time. You know, it's like the old saying of, how do you eat an elephant? You eat it one bite at a time. We want bite-sized pieces. The easiest way to implement these new science and engineering practices is to do them in bite-sized pieces. So while the standard may have a ton of different components to it, if you break it down into those bite-sized pieces, uh, this particular one, we're gonna talk about how this science benefited um, society. The next one, we can talk about scientific thought. Um, the process, you know, just bringing, bringing in little tiny pieces for everything that you do, but it has to be very intentional to be able to spread it out throughout a school year. 
um, ways that we can get our kids thinking about this, you know, just talking about credibility. What is credibility? There's some really great uh, kid friendly videos, like kid generated videos um, about how do I assess the credibility of a claim. So helping them think through TikTok challenges um, and they're actually out there on TikTok and they're saying, look, this is how I can tell if this is real information or not. Um, there's ways that you can help them understand what is credible and what is not. Um, and then being able to communicate those findings. And then we get to the heart of, holy cow, there's so much out there. There's so much in these new teaks. There really is um, more meat than there ever has been before. Our, science and our scientific uh, process skills that we're transitioning from, they had a lot of these things in them, but they were not necessarily interwoven with everything that we did. Um, it was a lot of um, basic science skills, but now we want to put the kids in the driver's seat and really have them be the ones who are generating all of the information themselves. And it's not going to start that way, right? We're, we're going to have to scaffold up to it. But how on earth do we fit all of these new skills in with a curriculum that's already jam-packed with content? Um, and it's, it is, it's gonna be a challenge, but it can be done. Starting with the very beginning of the year, you, you're going to need to be intentional in planning our SCPs. Thinking about the four buckets that we started with, like what components of the standards are going to go with this discovery piece? Where can I work in a model? Where can I work in a, um, a way of uh, critiquing this investigation? Like thinking through those components of what fits where with your lesson cycle. So if you're doing the 5e lesson, what part works in your explain? What part works in the um, extend? Um, and it really is going to start with planning and it's gonna be intentional. You also will need to set your expectations. So one thing we wanna say is don't front load the standards. The SEPs specifically should be taught in context. So I admit fully that I was I was one of these people who did this is, you know, I start the year with my science, what is science unit? And that was teaching the scientific method. So up until a couple of years ago, uh, of course you taught the scientific method ex ex explicitly, like you had the unit that says, this is the scientific method and you need to learn the steps of the scientific method. <clears throat> we can't do that with the standards for the science and engineering practices. They need to be taught in context and they are practical skills. So as you are working through your content, you're making the most of your time with these science and engineering practices. That's what we mean uh, when you hear the term 3D teaching is the content is taught in context with the science and engineering practices as well as the recurring themes, right? So that looks like I'm teaching um, space, I'm teaching uh, the concept of gravity, and I'm using these particular engineering skills to teach that, and I'm doing it in the context of cause and effect. And you're looking at those skills together. Um, that's going to require that, that shift in the classroom. Um, and so by setting your expectations early, we want to go into the class saying, guys, this is going to be different than you've ever experienced before. We're not just going to sit and you're going to learn a bunch of facts and then you're going to be tested on the facts. This is make, you're going to have to think about things. You're going to have to question and um, talk about it and make models of it. Like you're in charge of how this is going to work. Set those expectations early. Set the expectation that this class is going to be different. And it, you know, the first week of school is a great time to do that. Do you want to spend the week talking about um, the scientific method or the science and engineering skills? We might need to do that at first with the recurring themes we kind of talked about, but even that should be in context. Let's get them doing experiments right away. Let's start modeling right away. Like have that experience in the class, the first week of school. And then we, 
you know, relationships are always key, but the relationships the students need with each other is going to be different. Like in science class, we're creating that safe space for collaboration and respecting the diversity of the class. Students are going to bring different skills. Some students are really good at asking questions. Really, 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 really good at asking questions. Sometimes too much. Um, but those students are going to be like great when it comes to generating ideas for an anchoring phenomenon. Some students are really good at being able to see relationships with things, cause and effect, patterns, um, bring those skills together um, as they're working together. So those rela relationships with each other as well as with you. And again, like we said at the beginning, that relationship with you is it's okay to question. Go ahead, question, question everything. Question me, question my data, question how we're going to do this, question why we chose this. Looking at it as um, a different kind of relationship. So uh, that's, that's also gonna be a bit of a challenge, I think, for a lot of us. Integrating these on an everyday basis is going to be key. So you've seen the breadth of the standards now. Like there are so many standards as far as what the kids need to be doing. Um, we want to make sure that that is part of them are doing science every single day. Asking questions should be something that they just build into their day. Always, you know, you can start with an anchoring phenomenon. That's great. We're generating testable questions. Um, and then that talking and the argumentation piece, discussion, debate, comparison. What do you think is the best way that we can model this? Is this model better? Like constantly bringing in those questions. If uh, for me, what that would look like is actually creating my own sentence stems. And I carried, I literally carried them in my pocket. And that way, as I'm walking around the room and the students are working on something, I can pull that out and have question prompts because I don't want to miss something. I want to be very intentional about how I'm using my time to bring in each of those different science. And so I may, you know, focus on different ones each week. I may have a running list that I kind of just go through, um, but it's daily. It's integrating it in every single activity, every single day. And everything we do. Again, it has to scaffold. Like there is this perception that I'm going to introduce a phenomenon and then the students kind of take over and they're going to generate questions and they're going to do their investigation and they're going to collect their data. Not everything has to be done by the student in every single investigation. Yes, they have to do them all, but they don't have to do them all all the time. So Maybe in today's assignment, I'm going to provide the question because this is what I want us to focus on. And I'm going to provide a graphic organizer and they're going to have to figure out what tools to use. Maybe tomorrow I'm going to let them come up with a question um, or a range of questions, like provide three questions that might help us explore this topic. Um, and then I'm going to provide a uh, the rest of the information that they have that they need including the investigation plan. Okay, so this is the plan we're going to use. You have control over that. You want to rotate, you want to mix it up. Every time may be different. Um, sometimes you're going to have to provide the evidence. They may not be able to do that. Um, sometimes you may want to um, provide everything to them and just have them work on that argumentation piece. It's okay to not have them do all of the experiment or all of the generation every single time, especially for our younger levels. So take comfort in the fact that just, you know, doing pieces and parts of it. Again, bite-sized pieces and part is going to be super key. Break down the teats. Again, you don't have to teach it all at once. Um, and that's kind of what we're going to be working on in uh, the breakout rooms here in just a couple minutes. So we really want them to be able to do all of these things and I just chose this one because it's it's hefty there's a lot there <laughs> um so we want them doing tables and bar graphs and line graphs and tree maps and concept maps and then obviously we can't do that all at once we just want to make sure it's broken out over the year so this might be one you really need to um look at as far as your scope and sequence and maybe make a note of where things will fit in. 
So when you're looking at your scope and sequence, thinking of your lesson plans, where things might work. So, okay, I'm gonna cover Venn diagrams here and here and here, and then I can do it in comparison with a flow chart in this one, like it's going to have to be built into that planning. And um, again, the combining your entire class data, it helps look for patterns. It helps you to guide them in things like looking for outliers, building consensus, and then computational thinking, that mathematical thinking with a larger number set, because they don't tend to get that much in a lot of the experiments we do. We don't get big numbers that they get to work with where they're looking at lots of data. And by building a class set of data, it helps to build that, that capacity. Um, <clears throat> before we take a quick break, I'm gonna, so the question in the chat says, could you have groups of students perform different, uh, yes, the, the jigsaw experience would work very, very well for this. Um, it's even with the, um, with the different types of data that you can collect. So maybe I have one group of students who I have working on a bar graph with a set of data, one working on a scatter plot or some other type of graph, and then we can compare who, what kind of graph works better for this. Um, I could have them looking at different pieces of the experiment. I could have one group that's working on questions. Like there's, they could be working on different questions throughout the class. There's tons of ways that you can break it up into groups. Um, the key there is just, they don't always have to be doing it all at once. Um, that I think would drive, that would be, jumping in with both feet for sure um, and probably a little much for most of us to begin with. I do want to um, just point out a couple of things with EdgeSmart specifically. Um, we do have these built in in a lot of different ways. So with our instruction modules, we've done it as, and again, I don't recommend front loading the, the standards. Like this is not probably something we want to just teach all at once at the beginning of the year, but there's lots of ways that we can support that as we go through the process. So um, observations and questions, you probably wanna start really early in the year. How do we ask really good questions? How do we ask testable questions? How do we make observations that are based in science, not just, um, you know, looking at uh, personal preferences or opinions? Um, those kind of things. So we have specific, uh, um, sorry, instruction modules for that. Uh, lots of different ways that you can incorporate it through readers. Um, for the lowest grade levels, what we chose to do was do actual um, readers for every single one of the specific scientists that were called out, scientists and engineers. Um, but you can incorporate them into other ways as well. And then as they go through upper grade levels, you know, have them doing other types of research on those same scientists. And they're supposed to bring in, um, for example, different careers in science. So again, we have the um, lots of different hands-on activities specifically for these science and engineering practices. And one I wanna, like, this is a great way to incorporate all of these science and engineering practices with this particular topic. This is the student version. Um, so the impact of plastics, this would be kind of like a, a research project that they could do together. You could do maybe one of these every six weeks again. Um, have them discuss the ways we use plastics talk about, you know, what if things were different? How would it be better? How would it be worse? What is um, a better option? We look at a picture that is polluted with lots of trash. They describe what they see. And then in this particular case, it says write a short story in which you imagine what it would be like for the fish living in a river with plastic pollution. So it's fairly simple, but it gets across the idea of, and I'll show you the teacher version of this so you can see the actual standards. And it's a little more in depth as far as the background information and everything. <clears throat> Here's the student version. 
So we're explaining how scientific discoveries and innovations, uh, innovative solutions to problem impact science and society. And we talk about the history of plastics. Again, what the students are supposed to be actually doing, um, ways they're, they're kind of putting themselves in the place of the fish. Um, it's a simple activity. This could be done in 10, 15 minutes in class and you've covered this entire standard. So looking at those science and engineering practices, they're built across lots of different ways. Um, math and science together, these are inquiry-based labs. I like this, um, this particular activity, we're talking about how to build in that critical thinking of evaluating uh, what's a good experiment and what's not by using advertisements. Um, that's something kids can easily relate to. They see what uh, like over a thousand advertisements a day. Generally, like the average number was just astronomical, um, and so that's something that they can relate to easily using real-world examples. So not only are they built in like explicitly, but we also want to build in that um, capacity within every single one of their content instruction pieces. So in this case, one way that we've done that is with the instruction module companion. We have, if you're familiar with these, we have the note-taking guide. And then in the graphic organizer, this is using those science and engineering skills. Um, they, within the graphic organizer somewhere, they're gonna be comparing, they're gonna be um, justifying, finding evidence, finding, um, evaluating, all of those things that they need to be doing in those science and engineering practices are found within this second uh, graphic organizer. So it's already built in. And then the third component is a, a journal prompt, which is then going to bring in the recurring theme. So now we have content, science and engineering practices, recurring themes. It's all built into this one activity. That's 3D instruction. So there's lots of different ways that you can do this, um, but that's just one example. Graphic organizers, having them think through the examples, think through those different uh, content pieces. It's a great way to be able to incorporate those. So uh, we're running just a little bit behind, so we can just take a quick break, um, maybe put five minutes or so, and then we'll come back for our um, breakout rooms. So it's 11.09, let's come back at 11.15, and we'll go into breakout rooms. Um, and be able to start figuring out exactly how to apply all these awesome skills that we get to put in. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat uh, in the break time. And otherwise, we'll see you at 11.15. Awesome. All right, y'all. So I know that was really quick. Um, but we're about to go to our breakout rooms. In the meantime, I did put an attendance check link in the chat. So if you would please go into the Google form and it's just asking for some basic information so that you can get credit for attendance today. Uh, you'll get three hours of CTE credit as well as all of the follow-up information, which will be the vertical alignment documents, the spreadsheet, the uh, slide deck that I'm using and a copy of the recording. So that uh, link is in the chat right now. And then quickly before we go to our breakout rooms, I did want to share a couple of more practical, this is kind of just quick tips and tricks for these science and engineering processes. Um, as you get to know them, we really want to um, start getting our students to shift their mindset from learning facts to generating their own explanations. And that's the difference between the um, process skills that we've been using, which are very fact-based, um, to, you know, not, we don't just want them learning content, we want them to create their own explanations. Um, so question everything, have them question absolutely everything. Uh, they can be generating questions for, or generating ideas for investigations. That's ways of planning it. Uh, and that's something we can start at the lowest level. So we want them to you know, you're introducing a new topic and you just go, you know, how could we figure that out? How could we test it? Um, how would we know? What could we do to uh, help them understand or help understand that? Um, 
it doesn't always have to be, you know, a formal kind of idea, idea setting. We always want to start with that phenomenon and then just generate questions from there. Um, modeling. Models can be a lot of different things. They do not have to be a 3D model. It doesn't have to be a globe. It can be a sketch, a quick sketch in their comp book or in their journals. It can be a drawing or a chart or graph. There's lots of ways that you can do modeling that isn't time consuming and is easy to compare. So just get them into the habit of creating a picture for each concept that they learn. And then explanations don't always have to be written. We, of course, want them writing in science. Like that is a very, very basic skill. Science is writing. Um, and so we want them writing, but oral explanations are very valid. Drawings are very valid. If they can draw a model or draw an explanation and write a couple of captions on it, you know, sometimes our, our students are really struggling with this whole writing skill thing and um, you may not have the time for it. One second. So that's what I was saying about, uh, you know, having dogs and kids, you never know what's going to happen. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so uh, explanations can be quick drawings, can be models, can be an exit ticket. It can be, uh, you know, rapid kind of, yeah, drawing, labeling, all of that's great. A um, couple other things. Anchoring phenomenon are your friends because they give us something to come back to over and over and over again. So the anchoring phenomenon we used today was the TED talk of kids who are in, who are like second graders when the actual experiment happened. They were eight to 10 years old and they did real science. They contributed um, this authentic research. They wrote and published their paper. Um, we've referred back to it several times over. And hopefully, I really would love if you would go out and watch that video because it's just extraordinary what these kids did. Um, they literally published a scientific paper in crayon. Uh, but it gives you a basis for asking questions and generating ideas. You create that shared experience that allows you to then um, build from that. Exit tickets are awesome. But exit tickets specifically on the SCPs. So what kind of investigation could we use to um, analyze this piece of content that we just learned? Actually writing a exit ticket um, says saying, you know, analyzing the, um, do you think this experiment was valid? Do you think there's any bias? Um, was there a conflict of interest? Is an authentic argument? What do you think is the best type of model we can use or the best type of data collection we could use? Your exit tickets can cover those those scientific and engineering practices specifically. So I always, I mean, I used a ton of exit tickets, but it was always on content. Um, try shifting that around and using it for the SCPs. And then we want to really be specific. Uh, as we scaffold into the new standards, it's going to become even more more challenging. Um, the couple of years of transition, um, and so what are three testable questions we could ask about this topic. Like we want to make sure that they are understanding when we're talking about questioning, when we're talking about modeling, we're going to have to build in that really specific terminology and teach them ways of asking those questions, give them scaffolds, give them question prompts um, or sentence starters for ways that they can talk about these things. And having anchor charts would be a great idea, great way of doing that. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the breakout rooms, and there's going to be two breakout rooms, one for elementary, one for secondary. You will place yourself in a room. Uh, if you don't get the message for some reason, just send me a message and I will put you in whichever room you uh, are wanting to be in. The, um, the plan for the breakout room is for you to be able to work with people within your own grade levels and plan your first unit. We've said it over and over again today that you're going to have to be specific and intentional in how you use the engineering um, processes, these science and engineering skills. How am I going to incorporate a Venn diagram? How am I going to incorporate a, you know, whatever kind of a chart or graph or model? Um, so what SEPs flow within a specific type of content? 
look at your overall scope and sequence or think about your overall scope and sequence and where can I get that data? I'm gonna send you links to the um, vertical alignment so you can see that if you need it. Uh, so I'll place those in the chat. Um, and then thinking about ways you can get your students to engage and ask questions. There's very different skill set for getting a middle schooler to ask good questions than there is getting an elementary kid to ask good questions. So how do we get them asking questions? And then um, engaging in constructing explanations and um, using models and all of those different skills. And then the last question here I think is really important. What do you see as the biggest challenges in implementing these in any particular unit? So we want to start with your first unit and then you can build that as you go. Um, we will have, it's 11.23. So we'll have 25 minutes in breakout rooms for you to work with the people around you uh, at your same grade level. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up the breakout rooms now. You can choose which room you want to go to and I'll be popping in and out to check on everyone and, and make sure you have everything you need to answer those questions. So you might want to grab a screenshot of that if you need to, just to um, see what you're working on. And we'll come back together in 25 minutes. All right, well, I, uh, I hated to end that discussion because there was a lot of really, really great discussion going on. Um, and I really appreciate that. I know there's a, a Ms. Jan's uh, encouragement at the end is we're gonna be okay. It's going to be okay. <laughs> uh, we do have a year, luckily, to really learn these and to get comfortable with them. And I think just knowing ahead of time where we're headed for that, I mean, this is like a huge benefit and will serve you very well if you jump in now and then um, build this into the kids as we go. And then next year when we actually have to have them, it'll make a big difference. Um, so does anyone want to share like just a quick like synopsis of um, how how your room went, how your planning went, any big takeaways that you might have gotten? This would be a great time to um, collaborate with that, with people who are working with you. Anyone from the elementary group want to share kind of one of your big takeaways uh, with our secondary teachers? Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and I'll share the elementary discussion. Thank you. Um, we talked about um, coming together, especially in our first unit of classifying matter, which is so broad. Um, we discussed ways to use the claim evidence reasoning um, you know, to get kids to start talking and engaging, um, and their, and you, and justifying their reasoning, backing it up with their evidence, presenting it and having that collaborative discussion. But even before that, we got to talking about how, especially in the classifying matter being the first part of the year, um, that would be a good way to train them to start planning their own investigations, proposing the idea to them like having materials and having them do the planning on how to investigate, how to, you know, test relative density or solubility or magnetism instead of us constantly giving to them. That's a good like stepping stone into the rest of the year. That's great. I love that idea of scaffolding by you provide the tools. So you're giving them a place to start. You're not just like, mm -hmm. okay, let's plan an investigation. You're really giving them that scaffold that they need and then just taking, they're taking that next step. Yeah, because a lot of us, and I'm sure, well, I don't know. I mean, a lot of us, I've been to a couple of schools and it's kind of the same way. We have all these materials that we always put out and classifying matter and you use them for every bit of classifying matter, magnetism. Well, which one of these are going to be magnetic? Which one of these are going to be more dense or less dense? But instead of us, yeah, we're just going to have those materials and then have them you know, work on preparing their own investigations with it. How would they test it? Absolutely. That's, that's an awesome way to start and, and have them getting, getting through that process where they're learning to uh, make their own questions and solve their own, those problems. Anyone from secondary want to share a little, just a little bit of your discussion with, uh, I know you got a little off track, but it was a great discussion still <laughs> uh, with, uh, with our elementary crew. 
I can share real quickly. Basically, we did the same thing. We talked about ways that we've used in the past that now we can use these SE, um, SEP tools. And so we were realizing that it's not so much different. It's just being more, um, more, oh, I can't think of the word. I'm just <laughs> trying to identify, you know, which ones we've used and how now they fit into the SEPs, how they fit into the reoccurring themes, et cetera, et cetera. But it's kind of the same thing, you know, it's not like we're going to reinvent teaching all over again. And this year is going to be our experimentation year. You know, we get to try things and they can work or not work. And I think that's going to make me feel a lot more comfortable the next year when my content changes and I've already tried some of these things. So I think we all enjoyed the discussion. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. The more you can get comfortable with the, the these other parts of it now, when the content changes, you'll you'll be on a really good track. Because that's going to be uncomfortable too when it when it hits. It's you know it's going to be challenging just like all the others. Awesome! Oh, thank you so much for sharing. I really appreciate that. Um, I am going to. Oh, go ahead. Intentional. That was the word. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it is, and it's going to be intentional. Just you know, putting the kids in the driver's seat, and that's it's where they it's where it should, the way it should be. So. Um, I just want to, you know, as a quick little wrap up, remind you next, that's June, uh, the last in our series for the new, um, the new part of like the low hanging fruit, at least, um, is going to be next week on Tuesday, same time, same place. Uh, this will be three dimensional learning, kind of putting all together the recurring themes, the engineering practices, and then or the science and engineering practices and um, content and how we'll look at those as a coherent kind of lesson. Um, and then in July, we're gonna talk a little more about content specific because the content is changing. Um, the question about moon phases, you know, that's, that's sixth grade teachers are having to teach things that they've not taught in a long time or ever. Seventh grade is a huge change. I know the same thing for third and fifth grade especially, but every grade level is having new content. So we'll be kind of looking at the content through the lens of the students um, every week, every Thursday in July. Um, if you're not an EdgeSmart customer already, you can get a free preview. There will be a link in the chat for, or in the um, slide deck when you get it. So you can get a free preview and check out some of the content. And that's really it. I really appreciate y'all being here. And um, if you come up with any questions, my email is leah at edgesmart.com. And this is what I do as training. So um, I'm more than happy to walk through any of this with you. Um, I love hearing ideas from y'all. So feel free to reach out anytime, um, any questions you may have. And do you know, if you are an EdgeSmart customer, we do have you covered. Like all of this stuff is built into our platform. So man, you're gonna, it's gonna be great when we start um, the new platform here and you're gonna get to see all this science and engineering and everything. So um, please just let me know if you have any questions and otherwise enjoy the rest of your week. Um, you should you should be receiving those certificates uh, very soon if you haven't already. I will double check on that, Ms. Varela, just because I think, I think you should already have them, but I will make sure that that happens and we get those. Um, otherwise, you'll be receiving your uh, certificate very soon, as long as you filled in the um, the attendance check. Um, I'll make sure that you have your certificate. If you have not filled out the attendance check, I will go ahead and place it in there again, so you have that. Oh, no, that's linked to the other thing. Um, but otherwise, again, thank you for being here, and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye, y'all. Thank you.